Hello. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the history of the telephone. So was this the right problem to solve? Absolutely. Up until this point in time, you had to write a letter if you wanted to communicate over a long distance. And to deliver that letter could take days and possibly weeks to arrive. So not terribly efficient. So as I go through this lecture, what I would like you to pay attention to are the affordances of what you see on screen. So what action is possible, the signifiers, where the action can take place. So if you can imagine a user using the telephones that you see on screen, and then mapping the relationship between operating controls and the function, the feedback, so what's communicating the results of an action, and then the conceptual model constructed by experience. Just by looking at something, you can understand how it works. Before we get to the telephone though, we do need to talk about the telegraph. The telegraph was developed over a decade. This was 1830 to 1840 by a group of inventors that included Samuel Morse. The telegraph revolutionized long distance communication as messages were sent and received within minutes. It worked by transmitting electrical signals over a wire laid between stations. In addition to helping invent the telegraph, he also developed a system called Morse code. The code assigned a set of dots or short marks and dashes, long marks, to letters in the alphabet and numbers based on the frequency of use. Letters used often, such as E, got a simple code, while those used infrequently, such as Q, got a longer and more complex code. So this allowed for the simple transmission of complex messages across telegraph lines. However, you needed someone versed in Morse code in order to send and receive messages. So these were not meant for home use. In 1844, Morse sent his first telegraph message from Washington, DC to Baltimore, Maryland. And by 1866, a telegraph line had been laid across the Atlantic Ocean from the US to Europe. Although the telegraph had fallen at a widespread use by the start of the 21st century, replaced by the telephone, fax machine, and internet, it laid the groundwork for the communications revolution that led to those innovations. Also, if you remember, the development of our modern QWERTY keyboard stems from telegraph operators transcribing Morse code. So there's an interesting connection there between words that are frequently used and how our keyboards are laid out for the most efficient use of that. So I do invite you to pause this video and take a look at the Morse code video. Again, it's like three, it's like three and a half minutes. Um, take a look at it. It's pretty interesting. I have that link in the description. So again, feel free to pause and then come on back. Okay, welcome back. So in 1850, the Western Union Telegraph Company was one of the first companies that developed around the new medium of telegraph technology during the 1850s. By 1861, however, Western Union had laid the first transcontinental telegraph line, making it the first nationwide telegraph company. So the telegraph had a profound economic effect, allowing money to be wired across great distances. So if you hear that wiring money from here to there, you now know where that came from. Thought this would be an interesting connection to a current global company and Western Union is definitely still around. Moving on a few decades, Again, the main form of communication was written, and if you wanted to communicate with a friend across town, the standard was to write a letter and pay a messenger to deliver it or walk it over by yourself. And in which case, 
what's the point? <laughs> in the mid 1870s, Alexander Graham Bell wanted to build a phonautograph, but he wanted it to approximate a human ear to test whether the sound waves could transform into recognizable symbols. The idea here was that the device would help the deaf see the sound of words. He tested this theory with a transcription machine and a real human ear, although it didn't quite work very well. And he actually got a real human ear from one of his doctor friends. Uh, that's another story. If you want to take a look at it, Google it. Uh, but he now understood how sound was received in the human ear. The next step would be to reproduce the action of the ear membrane and design an instrument to translate the vibrations into sounds. Suddenly the idea struck him that it might be possible to create an undulating electric current that could carry sound along a telegraph wire in the same way that air carried sound waves from the speaker to the hearer. The telephone receiver pressed to a human ear could act like an electrical mouth. <laughs> current flowing through an electromagnet would cause the receiver's membrane to vibrate. The vibrations would then hit the listener's eardrum, making it vibrate too. The listener's ear would interpret these vibrations as the sounds spoken by the person at the other end of the wire. On March 10th, 1876, in his Boston workshop, Bell set up receivers in separate rooms connected by a wire and powered by batteries. It's kind of the image that you see on screen there. His assistant, Thomas Watson, helped. It was late afternoon. They were both tired. Bell went to one room, Watson to the other, and then it happened almost like magic. Bell spoke on his receiver. Watson heard this. Mr. Watson, come here. I want you. It had worked successfully. A year later, the nation's largest cities began installing phone service. And by 1907, there were more than 6 million phones in use. It's crazy how quickly that came about. As service was installed throughout the early 1900s, a user picked up the earpiece on the left, cranked the handle on the right to generate enough current to connect with an operator at a switchboard. So if you can see all the way over on the left, th that is the phone that I am talking about. And kind of in the shadows on the right hand side is where the crank is. The user would tell the operator who they wanted to reach and the operator would connect them through a switchboard. This call switching would eventually be automated in the mid 1900s. A specific ring would sound on the receiving end of the number that you would call. And if they were home, they would pick up. Now, while users were talking on the line, other people could pick up on the line and listen in. So whether this was neighbors or other people in the same house, kind of making it a party or a party line. Uh, in these early telephones, the designs were intuitive. The handle for the earpiece afforded grip and was large enough to fit an ear, signifying listening. The crank afforded grip and signified circular movement. The mouthpiece afforded the width of a mouth and signified a place to speak. The angled shelf below with a lip afforded a sheet of paper and pencil and signified a writing surface. As we move to the right, you can see the simplification of the design along with the inclusion of a rotary dial. This gave users a way to dial in to a telephone exchange or switchboard for their region. So when we think about, we think about the complexity of a phone and its systems that's connected with it, we need schematic drawings of each part of the phone to inform a manufacturer about how to make the parts. And then you need the manufacturer to make the parts and assemble and package them to be shipped. You need workers to put the parts together. You need natural resources to mine the raw materials to make the parts. And you need workers to mine the raw materials. And we can keep going there, but I'm gonna stop there. In the 1950s, 
we all know this. <laughs> the telephone was revised by Henry Dreyfus. Uh, the only thing I do want to point out here is that the hen handset or headset is all in one. That was a, an innovative design at the time instead of having two separate pieces. And of course, 1959, 1960, uh, advertising and marketing enters the game, creating the idea that a phone can be both utilitarian and an object of decoration in the home, creating a market desire. Uh, also, with the princess phone, the rotary area lit up. It's kind of fun. I had never seen that lit up before. The phone evolution. So all the way on the left, we have a phone from the 1970s. So it's still a rotary phone, right? You put your finger in the rotary where the white dots are, and then you turn your finger, and then you take your finger out, and then it back to its home spot. And you had to dial your, what, seven digit number. So still rotary and copying Dreyfus's design but now they're being hung on the wall instead of sitting on a table. And they're starting to come in fun, bright colors, furthering the idea of an object for decoration and function. They also started coming with clear cases so you could actually see the insides of the telephone. And we still have a corded experience. So it's plugged into the wall, and then the, the rotary area is plugged into the handset or to the headset. As we move into the 1980s, we have mobile technology that is starting to be invented and utilized. <laughs> the second one in, you see the uh, Motorola Dynatech mobile phone. This was the first one invented. This allowed users to be untethered from the home so you could get, you can be in contact when you were out and about. So this was huge. However, this was only for the well-to-do in society. Uh, that phone, that Motorola Dynatac phone, the purchase price was $3,995. That's right, $3,000. $995. Kind of makes an iPhone look cheap. <laughs> but that was just for the phone. So if you actually wanted to make a phone call, which was the only thing you could do with those, it was billed at 45 cents per minute. A full charge took roughly 10 hours and it offered 30 minutes of talk time. It also offered an LED display for dialing or recall of one of 30 numbers that it could store. As we move towards the right, we have touch tone technology that is starting to permeate uh, the telephone service. This allowed for automation of customer service lines and other, other areas. They were still corded though. So you had to sit and chat or purchase a very long cord to be able to move from room to room. I also wanna point out that in the, up until this point, the mid, mid to late eighties and into the nineties, when you made a phone call, it was priced per minute and if it was a local call, it was a different rate than if you were dialing for long distance. And now it's not a thing because all of that is covered into one. But back then you had to pay for that. And long distance charges would add up very quickly, especially international charges. Also in the eighties, call waiting became a thing as well. And then all the way to the right, the Motorola Microtech 9800X debuted in 1989, making mobile communication a bit easier and better. 
as mobile phones became more advanced. In the 1990s, we see that designs are starting to focus more on lifestyles and offering up new technology that was cord free. So as you see all the way over on the left, this would have been the typical phone in a household in the 1990s. This would allow you to move freely around your home and still be able to clean or cook or you know, do whatever you needed to do while being on the phone. But I will say, these phones were always getting lost within the house. And then when you did find it, the battery was most likely dead. So you had to plug it in. <laughs> in 1994, we have the first smartphone, the IBM Simon. And then in 1999, we have the Nokia 8210. I did have one of these with an orange case. Uh, and then on the right, the Motorola StarTAC, which started the flip phone craze. On these phones, on the mobile phones anyway, you were able to make calls and texts. You may be able to take a photo uh, and then you can play a game or two and of course store your contacts. But that was about it. They were very limited. Towards the end of the 90s, mobile phones are definitely beginning to take hold in the marketplace and within our culture, and they were no longer for the rich or well-to-do, which kind of democratized their design. As we move into the 2000s, mobile phones became personal digital assistants, uh, as well as phones. So you could read emails, you can index your contacts, you had your calendar, you had alarms, uh, there was limited word processing capabilities. So if you look at the Blackberry and the, the Palm Treo, those keyboards were so tiny, they were so tiny. And I don't know if our keyboards of today uh, compared to those, but I just feel like they are so tiny. I don't know the usability of those. So all the way over on the right in 2007, the iPhone, which was a smartphone that, you know, arguably changed our lives forever. The first iteration uh, allowed users to browse full web pages, triangulate positioning with Google Maps, and easily download apps. That was the first generation. And of course, email and playing your music. Now, almost, what, two decades later, uh, we can take photos, post to social media, access bank accounts, we can FaceTime, Zoom, check the weather in real time, uh, we can do all these things uh, with our phones and our phones are even uh, mobile editing studios too. So as we see, this is no longer about the shape of the phone, it's about the functionality of it. And if you can recall from the Design of Everyday Things, chapter one, uh, if somebody has never interacted with a mobile phone before, an iPhone or Android, they would actually have no idea how to operate it versus the earlier telephones where the signifiers um, and affordances were very apparent. I don't think I need to tell you what happened between 2007 and now because you all were alive and you all experienced that. Here recently, in 2017 and 2018, we have the Amazon Echo Show and the Facebook portal. So we're able to communicate visually with our families and loved ones across great distances instantaneously. And you're able to see your faces, which always makes for a better uh, communication experience.
So through the lens of human-centered design, the telephone, we, the inventors of the telephone, they were focusing on the people they were designing for. So the shape of the phones took into account how the human body would, would interact with it, hands and ears, in an intuitive and user-friendly way. Thinking of the phone as a system and looking at all of the components, how it's all interconnected, the telephone became an object in the larger system of numbers, switchboards, cables, networks, and manufacturing. Finding the right problem, the fundamental basic problem. And I think that the right problem that they solved was to communicate instantaneously. And then always think about the big picture. What do you want someone to do? What's the final result that we care about? Well, what started as an experiment to help deaf people communicate really laid the groundwork for our telecommunications today. The final result that we care about? Making sure people can communicate over any distance in an instant. So seeing the history of the telephone should give you insight into how the problem of communicating over any distance has been solved. You should also note that the technology of a telephone has not changed much since the mid 1950s. However, the form that the interface takes will continue to evolve. Beyond our mobile phones and Zoom, I can only imagine what will be next. Thank you for listening.